notice. I want to get in first. So our church partners with a national charity, Christians Against Poverty. We help people in Crewe and the surrounding area who are struggling with um, you know, unmanageable debts. So my, me and um, friend Tim, we are employed during the week to do that. And we're just aware at the moment, I mean, you guys may have noticed this, that a lot of the prizes of things are kind of going up. And they're going to, it's perhaps going to get a lot worse um, starting in April. And we were just thinking, you know, there may be some people, you know, in our, in our church here who are, think, who are concerned about that, you know, who are worried about that. And um, we thought if there was enough people who were interested, we'd like to put on a little just get together where we can talk about, um, you know, how we can make our money stretch a bit more because it, things are perhaps going to get really tight for some of us. So if that's something that you would be interested in, um, just come and talk to me or Tim, if you see him, and we'll write your names down. If there's enough people, we'll, ha- we'll organise a little get-together and we'll just have a bit of a discussion um, about, you know, how we can make our money stretch a bit more. So, um, so that's just a little notice at the start. Um, so I'm kind of fully aware that this kind of sermon comes right in this context of... Um, you know, what the events that are going on in the news. And, um, you know, many people are calling them dark, kind of dark days. And, um, and I was thinking about what I'm, I was talking about today and thinking how in, in dark days we need, we need lights. You know, we need lights in dark days. And, um, and I was thinking about that verse, talking about Jesus. You know, the light shines in the darkness. The darkness has not overcome it. And how Jesus... You know, he, he, his own nation at the time was um, occupied by the Roman Empire. And, um, and, you know, we call him the light of the world, don't we? You know, and he was in this context where his own nation was um, overrun by the Roman Empire. And, um, and he was that light that shined in the darkness. And likewise, you know, he called the people who are his followers, you know, his church. He also called us, you know the light of the world, Um, you know, a city on a hill. So we're kind of called to be lights at this time. And that's kind of the heart of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, You know, we're talking about over the next few weeks what it means to be a missional disciple um, or someone who reflects God into the world. Um, So being a light in the world and it's really important at this time to be a light in the world and um, so I looked up because missional disciple it's a bit of an awkward phrase isn't it so um, there's a few definitions that I looked up on Google (laughs) so um, the role of a disciple the role of a disciple as someone who is engaged in God's mission in the world okay that's one Here's another one. Someone who partners with God to see his kingdom come on earth or to see his influence spread on the earth. And then a final one. A friend of Jesus who calls others into friendship with Jesus. And there's plenty of other ways and other definitions, I'm sure. I think the one Graham had put on was someone who listens to God and then goes and puts it into action. Um, so Graham did a little video earlier for this week. So, <clears throat> but just as the phrase missional disciple has two like words in it, um, so there are two fundamental parts of being a missional disciple. Basically, what is flowing into your life and what is flowing out of your life? This is what a missional disciple is, I think, and what I'm going to talk about today. You know, what's the inflow? What's coming into your life? And what's flowing out of your life? The outflow. So in the Bible, it says that we as human beings have a special, you know, calling on our lives. You know, this is what we believe. And also, you know, what it says in the Bible, that says when God created humans, according to the Bible, we were made in God's image and likeness. So that's in Genesis 1, verse 27. So our calling as human beings is to reflect God into the world. So when everyone sees a human, they should be reminded 
of what God is like. In a sense, we're like little versions of God, you know, just walking around. That's us. And I don't know if you think we've done a good job of this or not. Maybe at the moment, we probably think that we're not doing a great job of this. Um, and maybe we look at our own lives and we think, well, I don't know if I've done a good job of this. It turns out maybe we're not so good at it. Who knew? <laughs> but, um, you know, but God came in person, in the person of Jesus Christ. And he kind of showed us, you know, how it's done. You know, more than that, he kind of picked us up and he brushed us off. He sent us on our way. You know, and with, that with God's help, you know, this calling to, be, to bear God's image and likeness, to reflect God into the world, would be awakened again and renewed in us. You know, but how is all of this possible? I hear you ask. At the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way is a supermassive black hole. I don't know if you're aware of this. And black holes are a bit like stars that have kind of collapsed in on themselves. Um, and they have a gravitational force that's so strong that light just can't escape that gravitational field. This is why they're called a black hole, because you, just, you don't see anything. It's just black. And it kind of got me thinking. You know, this black hole at the center of our galaxy has had a huge influence, you know, on the planets and the stars in the galaxy, like a massive influence on them. And it got me thinking, you know, whatever we put in the center of our lives, you know, has a massive influence over all other parts of our lives. You know, the place at the center of our lives is a very powerful place. Whatever it is that we put there, you know, we give it a lot of power and influence in our lives. You know, and let's be honest. As Christians, we probably don't always put God at the center of our lives. And that probably happens more than what we would care to admit. But, you know, in order to see this great calling that is on our lives to be fulfilled in us, you know, God needs to be at the center, and I'm going to explain that a bit more. I mean, let's face it, whatever else we put at the center of our lives probably ends up disappointing us anyway. You know, who else could, could bear that responsibility but God? You know, as we believe and have, have experienced and have read in the Bible... Our God is a God who's defined as love. He is love. You know, in whose other hands would we want to put our lives in? Other than in the hands of love. You know, God has promised never to leave us or to forsake us. He's perfectly faithful in all of his ways. And like one of the disciples said, when Jesus dismissed them at one point, they said, well, where else, where else can we go? But when we put something else at the center of our lives, perhaps our lives become a distortion of what it could be. Maybe we fall short. Maybe we miss the mark. The Bible is full of verses that say about putting God first. And it isn't that God is somehow insecure and he says, like, he always needs to be our number one. That isn't the case. He understands. He knows how we're made. And he knows what we've been called to be. And he realizes that in order for that calling to be fulfilled, to happen, to become re real in our lives, you know, he needs to be first. Humans are like mirrors. You know, whatever a mirror is facing will be reflected by the mirror. So if the mirror is facing a person, it will reflect a person. If the mirror is facing a flower, it will reflect a flower. If the mirror is facing God, it will reflect 
You fill in the blanks. You know, what we behold is that which we will become. Whatever it is we worship, you know, we give influence to over our lives and we begin to reflect whatever it is, whatever it is that we worship. Jesus said this from Luke 14. <clears throat> you cannot be my disciple unless you love me more than you love your father and mother, your wife and children and your brothers and sisters. You cannot come with me unless you love me more than you love your own life. That's actually a very friendly translation. <laughs> There's a lot worse translations than that. It sounds a really harsh verse, doesn't it, when you hear it? But what Jesus is actually saying is that whatever you put first in your life, you're a disciple of that thing. So if, um, I don't know, if it's gardening, you're a disciple of gardening. If that's the first thing in your life. Um, so Jesus isn't being harsh here. He's literally, he's just telling the truth. He's saying that if you've got something else that's first in your life, you're a disciple of that thing. If you want to be my disciple, I've got to be first. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I don't think he's being harsh. He's just telling the truth. I was trying to think of an example to... to but I kind of fell into lots of stereotypes when I thought about this. I didn't want people to feel bad either, like I was getting at them. <laughs> but um, I'm going to use football as, an, as a, an example. It's very obvious, I know. I used to love football when I was younger. And, um, and if football was like first in my life, I would like... I love football now, by the way. I'm not saying this to make people feel bad about football. But... Um, you know, if you loved football, you'd like read about it. Maybe you'd think about it a lot. Maybe the money that you had, you'd spend it on, you know, football shirts, football magazines, subscriptions so you can watch football matches. It would take up your time. It would take up your energy. It would take up your thoughts. Um, you'd go to football matches. It would affect your diary, you know, what you do. And when you talk to that person, maybe the only thing you could really talk to them about was probably football. You know what I mean? If you get them on that topic, they'd be like, they'd be away. They'd be talking about it. You know, that person is a disciple of football. You know, what they worship, football, their life be begins to reflect that thing. They begin to look like a football. <laughs> you know what I mean? Nothing against football. I'm just using that as an example. It's an obvious one. But... um. So this is what I'm talking about. You know, whatever we put first in our life has a powerful place in our life. It shapes our life. And, it, you know, and we become that thing that we worship. You know, going back to what I talked about at the start, about being a missional disciple, that there are two parts to being a missional disciple, an inflow and an outflow. The outflow kind of depends on the inflow. What's flowing out of our lives is dependent on what is flowing into our lives. We cannot pass on a gift to anyone that we have not yet received ourselves. We cannot pour out anything that has not yet been poured into our lives. In this way, wait for it, this is my um, favorite part of my sermon today. In this way, we're a bit like a hosepipe. I was hoping Ian Dixon was going to be here today. I was thinking he'd love this. <laughs> he loves those, using these pictures of things. He's not here. But um, you know, like, we're a bit like a hosepipe, where we're connected at one end to the source or to the outside tap. And then at the other end, this is, this is definitely my favorite part of this sermon, at the other end is the nozzle. I bet the, noz the word nozzle has not been used in the sermon. <laughs> and from the nozzle, you know, the water comes out, sprays the flowers, you know, a bit of sunshine, a bit of water. Hopefully we get some growth, you get a nice garden. So, um, so both the inflow 
and the outflow are actually the same thing, really, aren't they? They're the same thing. The challenge is being connected to the source or the outside tap or to the right source and also not getting any kinks in the pipe that might stop the flow. I'm kind of stretching the analogy a bit far here, aren't I? I won't say anything more about that. So if Jesus was the one who got the human being thing right, what do we see you know, in his life that can help us hopefully get it right, or at least get it more right? And what we see in Jesus is that he established a rhythm like in his life where he spent time with his father in prayer, often withdraw into a lonely place. In John 5, 19, he says this, I tell you for certain that the son cannot do anything on his own. He can do only what he sees the father doing. And he does exactly what he sees the father do. You know, this must come from those times of prayer that Jesus had. You know, where he could see what the Father was doing. You know, those times of prayer helped Jesus to see things through God's eyes. You know, and then he would go out and put them into action. And there's a real dependence on God that we see here. Jesus surrenders his will to God's. And this is reflected in the prayers that Jesus prayed. Matthew 6, verse 10, part of the Lord's Prayer. Let your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And also in a, a tough time for Jesus himself, written in Luke 22, verse 42. Father, if, if it's your will, take this cup of suffering away from me. But however, not my will, but your will must be done. All that Jesus did flowed out of this intimacy that he had with his Father in heaven. It flowed out of this close relationship with God. And what he saw in God, and what he heard God saying, and what he saw God doing in the secret place was reflected in what he did when he was out in the world. And what do we see Jesus doing in his life? What outflow do we see? We see Jesus serving others, being moved by compassion to help others, healing, teaching, spending time with and welcoming all kinds of people, listening to what people's needs were and responding, and also sometimes ch challenging people. Maybe this is what love you know, looks like in action. And this is what a true human is supposed to look like. We're called to the same thing. Jesus came to show us what it looks like to be a true human being, a God reflector. And that when we share this kind of intimacy with God and with our Father in heaven, like Jesus showed us, this can be lived out in our lives too. It becomes possible again. I sometimes think with Jesus, the official line is we believe Jesus is um, fully God and fully man. That's what the creed says and what we tend to believe. And that's a bit of a mystery, okay? So that's hard for us to get our head around. Sometimes we, I think we put a lot of weight on the divine side of God. And I think kind of, he is part of the Trinity, he's part of the Godhead. Um, but the danger is sometimes we just want to worship Jesus, which he's worthy of. But when you look at, when you read the Gospels, Jesus isn't going around saying, hey, did you see what I just did back there? 
<laughs> that was me walking on the water. Just mean, worship me. He didn't, it wasn't really like that, was he? People did worship him when he did awesome things. But I think Jesus came to make this calling our lives possible again. And doable. What's, um, what's Jesus' probably most well-known catchphrase? It isn't worship me, it's follow me. It's follow me. He wanted to make this calling possible for us. That's why he came. Not to make it impossible for us, but to make it possible. You know, God being a human being gives us a way in. It gives us a way in. Because guess what? We're human too. And he encourages us. Jesus encourages us. Um, he kind of says, hey, my father, it's your father too. The relationship I have with God, you can have that too. Listen to this verse. And this, real, this verse really opened up for me up when I was thinking about this. Because um, I know some of us think, oh gosh, somebody else tell me how to, that I need to pray more. That's just what I need. <laughs> but like, I, when I read this verse, it, it sounded much more like an encouragement. It's like, hey, but when, it's in Matthew 6, verse 6, but when you pray, when you pray go into your room and you close the door, pray to your father who is unseen. And then your father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. That's an, that's an encouragement. He's saying, hey, you know, what I've got go, going on, that's for you too. That's for you too. Like I said before, my father's your father too. The relationship I have with God is, is what you can have too. And he encourages us to go, you know, and to spend that time like Jesus did in the secret place. To see what you know, God is saying, what is he doing? To get God's perspective. To get that inflow. And then to go out into the world, you know, and make him known. To let those things be the outflow so that we can be that light and so that we can be that thing that we've been called to, reflecting God's image, being a God reflector in the world, being a light, the light of the world. So Jesus said this in John verse 20, verse 21. I think it's true for us today, perhaps even more so in the times we're in. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. I'm going to hand over to Isabel just for us to have a bit of time where we just put that into practice a little bit. So, amen. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so much for us to think about uh, in what you've just said. Um, but we just felt uh, something like this. We can't just walk away. Let's put some of it into practice.